Going ashore? No, I don't look forward to it at all. I went off in early June, and I couldn't get back for two nights. I was hoping to come back the same day, but um, when you have a wife and child stuck on the island, you don't rest easy in your mind, and you know it could happen every time you go off. There's a possibility that you will be stuck over on the mainland, that the weather could turn. Slipping across to the shops means three miles of inhospitable water and ten miles of rough road. And you have to bring back the empties, all the way to Dingle. From the moment you set foot in town, the pressure is on to get back. Your list is endless. The bank, the post office, the supermarket. And this place, where you spent three years of your life, where you married, where Daniel was born, where your friends are, is just an obstacle to be overcome. This is the slow pace you favoured such a little time ago. Now, it hardly leaves you time to draw breath, never mind a pint of stout. Forget nothing. The larder will have to support you for another month. The problems of, of running a, a guest house on the island is that you, um, you never know how many people you're catering for. It's very haphazard. And um, supplies is the, is the main problem. Once you've got them here, keeping them, we haven't any refrigerator or anything like that. So we can only buy a certain amount of fresh stuff. Otherwise, we have to rely on dried things or produce from the garden, um, or rabbits, or fish. It's quite a contrast, the island and the mainland. Dingle playing the cosmopolitan cash register rhapsody to Blasket's shy sea wash blues. The life cycle of interdependence is complete. Roger comes in from Great Blasket, armed with revenue from last month's visitors, spends it in the Dingle shops buying provisions for next month's guests. They go out, they spend, he comes ashore, he spends. The law of supply and demand. Commerce. Every man is a part of the main, a piece of the continent. Living without out a lot of luxuries and a lot of things that other people take for granted makes you more and more inclined to realise that material things don't make life any easier. In fact, they, they can become a fetter. The less you have, the more free you are to get up and go somewhere else if you want to. People who surround themselves by possessions and luxuries find it incredibly difficult to get up and go and try something else. When they come to the island, they they asked me, how can you live without a fridge? Or how do you manage without hot water? How do you, how do, you do all that washing without a washing machine? Well, it's difficult, but it's possible. People have done it in the past easily and never thought twice about it. When you go back to civilization or whatever you would call it, and you have those things again, I find that I appreciate them for a very short time. But after that, I just take them for granted and I miss the, the freedom of doing without them, in a way. Perhaps it's basic to human nature to feel guilt at one's dependence on things material. Somewhere inside us, isn't there a fear that our inherited skills, our survival craft, may have been lost among the machines which ease our daily life? Don't ever get too far away from nature, just in case. You never know. Someday the system might break down. It's like letters. They don't have an overseas delivery and carry. So post for the Hambrooks has to be picked up from the post office on Roger's shopping expeditions. Hey, is that Daniel? Ooh, is that you? Look at you. Baby! Baby! <laughs> baby! God, is it really him? No. Oh, it is, you know. 
looks like the person yes, who went back. I can hardly remember what he looked like then. You sure? Let's have a look. That's you. Oh, goodness me. Daniel. 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 Look, Daniel, Daniel again. Mm. Now, again, convey your thanks for your hospitality during my stay in the island. Letters are always an event out here, and many of them are from recently departed guests, thanking, hoping, planning to return. One can forget many innkeepers, but not those who share the cup of friendship in desert places. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even think he really enjoyed it here. Or what? No, not did I. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? That's nice. Some strange. <laughs> So long ago. I'm oh, crying. Look, appointment for Daniel at the hospital. <laughs> we haven't got much hope of keeping that, have we? No. I think that the hazards that are here are just different hazards. All I've done in bringing Daniel here is exchanging some dangers for other dangers. Here he could fall down a cliff. He could, he could get ill, and we wouldn't be able to get medical help very quickly. But it, if he was living in a city, um, there's a terrible uh, number of dangers that could befall him there. At least I don't have to worry about roads and cars here. And, but I do feel sometimes that other people and other things are taking a lot of my attention. I don't get the impression from Daniel that he feels that I'm not giving him enough attention. Occasionally, of course, he does create a fuss. But I think, in general, he's... he's fairly well balanced. And another thing that he has, which I think he's very, he's very fortunate in, is that he has Roger and myself, the two of us, around him all the time, which a lot of children, in fact, most children don't have. The husband is out all day working. He may only see his children in the evening to put them to bed, this kind of thing. But right from the start, for two years now, I mean, Daniel's had both of us around him all the time. And uh, I think that's a really good thing. I'm very fortunate too, as I have Roger here, and we're both doing something together. I think that's great. I think a relationship that um, survives when you're together all the time is much better than one which is good because you don't see much of one another. <laughs> I don't think that's a very good state of affairs. I think I'm very fortunate to be uh, in this sort of situation. No. Communications here aren't good. They're probably too good, obviously, in July and August, but outside of those two months, we've had several continuous days of, of no contact and the mist coming down, where we couldn't even see the sea, let alone the mainland. This is, this is a difficult problem. Um, we have, of course, done all we can to, to um, ensure that we do keep up visual emergency communication with the mainland, but this obviously goes out when the mist does come down. <laughs> I don't know whether it would be so easy to manage here in the winter. It, it would be a different problem, keeping warm. There wouldn't be any supplies available. We'd have to live on dried food or use whatever's here. And obviously, we wouldn't have any garden produce in the winter. There'd be rabbits, there'd be fish. Um, but from the isolation point of view, it worries me having a young child um, that would be the main, the main worry, really, that something might happen and you wouldn't really be able to get help quick enough. It's not so much of a problem in the summer because there's people coming to and fro fairly, fairly frequently. But in the winter, it could well be a problem. I don't know whether it's a good idea to inflict that on him when he's so young. And also, he would miss companionship, I'm sure, because there would just be ourselves here. And I think it would be a bit unfair for him to be stuck with us all the time for maybe eight months of the year, which it would be, because the summer here is very, very short. The winter goes on a lot longer. <laughs>
I don't tend to make plans. I prefer not to. It's another thing to do with um, possessions. If, um, if you make too many plans, when an opportunity or a situation presents itself, you, you're not free to take it up because you've already planned your life ahead for a few years to come. So you think, oh, no, I can't do that because I was going to do such and such. If you leave your life open when something comes along, like the island situation, if we'd planned our lives ahead, we wouldn't have been able to take up this opportunity. And I, I'd prefer to believe um, fate to take a chance. I have great faith that things turn up. I'll be quite happy to carry on like that for a while. If it seems right to stay here, then we'll stay. The way of life here is, it is as I envisage it. I've no regrets. It's, it's fulfilled everything that I hoped for, and if not more, especially when we do get a great deal of time to ourselves. And this is, this is an asset. I mean, if you're going to live a life, then what time you have to live, you should, a greater degree of it, you should be able to, to use yourself, you know, and do what you want to do. Great Blasket is a courageous stop. I don't believe it matters if the Hambrooks don't stay forever. It's as well to leave one's options open, living on islands. In life, we're always on the hunt for the sublime, for that which is a luminous, inherent dignity. But we find it at our peril, for then we come face to face with ourselves. <laughs>